Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to uh, resume Dr. Kogan's podcast. Today is a very special podcast. I have my uh, childhood best friend, uh, Amir Terzaskal, founder of Darwell, here with me today. And he asked me to talk a little bit about some of the concepts as they relate to aging, longevity, science. We started talking and this idea came, you know, um, let's actually walk through complexity of some of this chat ask questions we both have been interested in this topic for quite some time um, and uh, we've recently spent time together in Israel and kind of reconnected deeply and um, unfortunately had to separate again but this helps us also to stay close so um, so yeah uh, with this uh, welcome everybody I'm gonna hand mic to Amiel, to say a few words before we move forward. And please don't mind that it says Maxim Azorin over there on his name. Uh, we forgot to change it. This just makes it cuter. So Koryshka, um, that's Emil's other name. Koryshka, welcome. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Mishka. It's a very good opportunity you know, to, to ask you questions and actually to, to get answers, uh, which are important for me and uh, also, I assume, for many friends of mine. Uh, let's do not hide it. We are all of us. We are mid-age, mid-age male and uh, female, and we actually start thinking of what is what is waiting for us in the in the recent or not so recent future. And actually, um, you know, I uh, I thought of the recent decades as very, 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 very significant milestone in the modern medicine because uh, the lifespan is increasing and actually um, it is not it is not um, it is not a miracle to, you know to die at the age of uh, 87 89 90 91 uh, however uh, most of the people i saw in my life and you know, I do not know the the statistics. Probably you you will share a light on this. Uh, but as far as I understand, most of the people uh, after after passing the, the age of eighty, they do not really enjoy their life because they are mostly suffering either from the cognitive uh, cognitive dis disorders, the Al Alzheimer and. Uh, like that, or from different kind of uh, physical disabilities. So, if you remember our visit to to Ikari Island, yeah, what what was amazing is actually that the people after eighty, they are dancing, they are walking, they are talking, and they are managing very active life. Now, here in the West, people also manage very active life, but this is the most common picture, like in Israel on on Friday morning that you see these old guys with the wheelchairs being accompanied by their, uh, by their, yeah, by their. You're right. So no, you're, 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 you're Yeah, so uh, that's the point. And uh, what I ask myself is, you know, getting, getting closer to that time. I, I ask actually whether I would like to have these five or 10 years of suffer at the end of the life or I would like to actually to, to end this on my will at the point I understand that there is no way back. So, I, you know, <laughs> you're asking the, the, the real tough, real life questions. And uh, let's go right in. Let's do all right in. So I'm going to put some slides back on. Um, should be able to uh, share my screen. So, so successful aging is far beyond being healthy and vibrant. Uh, it is rectifying internal conflicts, paradoxes, redefining life. Meaning I'm so glad you brought up this whole point of this last 10 years for people off and they feel really sick. You know, and a lot of this is unavoidable. Some of it is, um, and we'll touch upon some of these basics and we'll talk about actual, where are we today? What do we know? Where are we going? But I think the way you, position this that look i'm let me pull the plug if that happens to me is what a lot of people say and unfortunately the reality is that when you actually get to the 
to the actual state there at that point, things are look a little different. I mean, it's we say one thing when we're middle aged or when we're simply not yet having this experience, but the reality is always a little different. But it doesn't diminish the fear. It definitely does not diminish the overall importance of this topic. More important, it just makes it even more real and more important. So as you exactly pointed out, we're living longer. Um, so there's a projection that sometime by the end of this century, in a lot of countries, the life expectancy will cross 90. It actually already did cross 90 in Korea, only in Korea for now, my understanding, and, and uh, Japan is very close. Interestingly, uh, out of this list of very developed countries, except on the right, on the figure five, you also see Russia, which we can talk a little bit about as well. But as you see on the left, uh, uh, United States is there in the red right here. It's at the bottom of this curve with Japan leading. And actually, Korea is not here, but Korea is actually even higher than Japan at this point, especially for women. But bottom line, there seems to be a, an increase. In the last three years, we're actually seeing a drop in uh, in U.S., there's a many reasons for that. Of course, COVID is one pandemic of uh, opioid overdose and deaths related to the medications is the second. Um, so it's a combination of factors. But nonetheless, there's an expectancy or there's a <laughs> there's a prediction that life expectancy will keep growing. So what? where does it put us? So if we're all living longer, but we're really sick at the end of it, so what can we do, right? I mean, I think that is your main question. And um, you asked me ahead of this chat time together to explain to, to you and to everybody, what is the mortality compression? And I think it's a probably in a sense, a critical concept that if you don't understand it, you will have a little bit harder time kind of getting a sense on what is possible here. So what is mortality compression? Well, you can think of it in two different graph forms. Um, in both situations, you're kind of moving to the right here. So your goal is instead of trying to say, look, I'm going to live to age of 80, but my last 10 years, I'm going to be sick. I'm going to say, look, I'm going to live till 79, not being sick, but then I'm going to compress my mortality in just 12 months instead of 10 years or whatever the topic is, whatever that length is. So you can see that this is a current present. It may be, say, starting at 55 and 76. This, again, are all these numbers, just random numbers. You can position them wherever you want. So what you're trying to do, you're really trying to shift to the right while you're also expanding the life extension. So at the same time. So what you don't want to have, you don't want to have an expected life expectancy increasing, but also increasing the total length of being sick. So like who wants to be sick for 25 years, right? That's a lot. But you also don't want to do the opposite. So you don't want to say, look, I'm going to get sick at age of 55. I'm just going to end my life at age of 70 and I'm going to compress my mortality, but I'm going to take my life ahead of where I could have been. So that's actually going to move you to the left, reverse of what you want to do. And um, interestingly, the mortality compression has been increasing just expectedly because we have conquered a lot of childhood mortality, middle life mortality from infections, from kind of acute illnesses, acute trauma is well managed now. So things like that. But we're also reaching a certain point of kind of a, plateau of the mortality compression, if you will. We've reached a certain level of doing best, uh, particularly as we talk about chronic disease management. And in some way, we have actually started losing mortality compression, so to speak. We're moving to the left because we're expecting life expectancy. We're advancing it, but we're keeping people longer and they're much sicker because we manage their chronic illnesses better, but we're not reversing their chronic illness. This is really critical concept. People tend to actually have more chronic more conditions, more morbidities, more chronic illnesses, but we're just trying to make them live longer by managing those conditions without having a chance of reversing or curing them. And that is a critical aspect. This is where the integrative medicine comes in. And um, I'll pause here and see if you have questions or if you want to comment on this. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and asking about the, the mortality compression, actually, if I understood you correct, the, the theory, is it mean that a, a more dense mortality compression allows us to live longer and die faster. 
you in, in, this in essence, in yeah. essence, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in your opinion, what are the factors which might help us to in achieving, like, uh, you know, living a longer life but having the the much uh, much denser mortality compression rate? Right. So the most obvious answer to this is that at this point, we have to learn how to delay onset of chronic illnesses in an older age. Mm -hmm. And you can define that word older. I mean, 55, we're a couple of years away from that. That's not that old, right? So you mean you can position that number wherever you want. Um, here, I think 55 was picked as kind of an old geriatric definition, 23 yeah. years ago. But let's just put that number at 65. I think it's more appropriate like this, this kind of the way it's at the bottom here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you think of it that way, then how do we make sure that by the time we get to 65, we don't have any chronic illnesses? This is the, the crux of it. Because if you manage to get there, and you delay the appearance of hypertension, you delay the appearance of diabetes, you delay the appearance of, you mentioned Alzheimer's disease, the further you deflect that, the further you don't have it, or you start having it, but then you reverse it, or you manage it mm -hmm. so, so well that the condition itself does not tend to make, affect your quality of life negatively, because that's another big point, right? Let's say hypertension often managed with medications. Most of the time, they don't necessarily cause problems, but they may. And there are other ways of handling hypertension, of course, you know, exercise and, and a better diet and other things. But in essence, if you delay that moment of onset of multiple problems, they're definitely gonna in, in, worsen your quality of life. You're looking for that. So that's number one. Number two, which is also in some ways much more important, is that to realize that often delaying the death is not necessarily the number one goal. You, at some point, we had this little argument before we jump on the video, is what should we talk about euthanasia? You really want to talk about it. I was kind of resisting. And now I'm bringing this back, this word back for one particular reason. Because unfortunately, no matter what I say or what we, we say, most of the people at the end of life will have some suffering. It's unavoidable. And most of those lost, I would say, six months will have the point where you're probably going to want it to check out. It, the, you know, and yes, there's some people who don't get there, but a lot of people who do. And so it's not that crazy to mention this word because more and more people say, I don't want to be dependent on somebody else. I don't want to suffer this level. So yeah, so you can do it from that end. Uh, you can basically say, yeah, sure. I can also compress mortality from the other side by simply ending the suffering and not wanting to last. So there's more than one thing that goes into mortality compression. But, you know, it, it's also tells us to, to the fact that, well, maybe if we just simply don't have a chronic conditions in that level, maybe if we manage quality of life a lot better than we currently do, we'll never need to talk about to most people about the, the word euthanasia at all. And I think that would be the most desirable goal overall. Okay, great, thank you. So you, yeah, okay, you put here a few, few very important uh, points that uh, every one of us has to answer to himself actually. Because uh, I frankly believe that uh, each one of us is uh, holding the whole reliability reliability on his own life and the whole um, actually yeah the whole reliability and uh, every one of us have to to answer himself the question how how does he want to live and how long does he want to live yeah and, and those uh, 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 yeah those what, are is very... the, what is the point that uh, you have to say okay thank you i enjoyed this enough you and know, and that's a very hard this. question. That's a very yeah. hard, very hard. I, I think, <laughs> I guess you and I never had it that easy in life. And, and we understand that, you know, you have to ask yourself this question. And the earlier you start asking yourself this, the more you think about it in a way, the more you're prepared when the time comes, so to speak. So I, I, yeah. I, I agree with you completely. And, um, and yeah, and I'm actually, I'm going to divert here for a second because I used to be very heavily against um, medical assisted uh, suicide or euthanasia, whatever the word you want to use. And the reason was that, you know, as a physician, you really ethically have to continue to make people 
live longer. I mean, there's a certain ethical obligation. In some religious and spiritual backgrounds, um, I mean, it's, there's no choice in essence, right? So you, as a doctor, you can't just help someone to end life because it's against the religious values. You know, so there's also that important aspect. But what, what turned my opinion around, I was driving from Vermont uh, when kids and I, I think Angela wasn't there, kids and I went skiing and then we were driving from New York, from Vermont, and I, I was just listening to the radio music. And then somehow I stumbled on this program where the guy was talking about the, 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 the anchor was discussing the, some news. And then suddenly they switched to this program where they talked about this gentleman who lived in the forest as a logger basically his entire life. And then he got cancer and he basically wanted to leave. And the way that was discussed, it was his friend who was talking about his life. I suddenly realized that this man, absolutely, he didn't want to accept any chemotherapy. He didn't want to, not because necessarily he felt that the amount of suffering is going to be something. He, no, because for him, the quality of life, and this is critical, was if I can walk in my forest with my dog and do what I used to do, that's fine. But if I can't, I'm out. And the way the friend described this clicked with me because then I positioned myself in his shoes and I realized, you know what? It's not necessarily all about the amount of suffering. It's about what is our personal quality of life means to us. Does that mean, you know, me being able to walk for two, three miles every day? Does it mean that for me to enjoy certain food? Does it, you know, and each of us have to make our own decisions here. So this particular man made the decision that no, if I can't be in the forest, in the, fully independent, by the way, I don't want anyone in my house, then I'm out. And I realized I have no ethical capacity to judge that statement. If that's what the patient wants, we have to honor that and we have to have a system in place to allow for that to occur. Mm -hmm. Now that's again, I'll go back and say, look, that's not necessarily what I would prefer. And I am a no, no expert in what we, in, in DC, we call this death with dignity. Um, we have an actual legal process in which someone with a terminal condition can apply and then obtain medication and end their life. Um, they, they, have, they can have a helper or they can take medications on their own. Um, and I actually working closely with a doctor who's very supportive of this and writes the recommendation for those patients. And often I help this doctor, Dr. Roth, to, with this process. But, you know, again, I, it took me a while to get there and I don't really consider myself an advanced expert in this topic, but I feel the compassionate importance of this for a lot of the patients, especially as a geriatrician and a palliative care doctor. But anyway, let me go to what I'm really, yeah, really sure. passionate let's, yeah, about. Let, let's go, yeah, let's go forward to more, yeah. more optimistic. Yeah, stuff. yeah let's, let's go to, all right. Yeah, so, so please, <laughs> like, um, tell, tell me a bit about how does integrative approach addresses this issue of sure. um, of managing a yeah, more active life for longer time and what is right. the difference between integrative approach to like you know to western approach to eastern approach whatever you call it right so what can so in essence what can we do now not tomorrow not in 20 years with some longevity amazing pills or anything what can we do today so let's talk about this before we can jump right in there you really I think the listeners really have to understand some basics about why we age. And it's actually a very complex question. Nobody actually has a clear sense of why. Why are we aging and why do we have to age? It's never been fully proven that the process of aging itself is something that is either random, completely random, or has a certain programmed or pre-programmed status. And it's probably a combination of both. Over the years, there's been multitudes of different theories I'm putting some of them, uh, listeners can get the full list from my book, or there's, you know, there's, there's lots of resources online. So in essence, some of the ideas that were propagated that um, I'm liking, because I can clinically work with them, and I can help my patients with them. So for example, the mitochondrial deterioration, or what we often call that mitochondrial dysfunction, it's how you produce energy inside your cells, we can actually optimize that. Of course, social and functional isolation 
critical, right? So I'm, I'm noticing how some of my patients and even those who are close to me, how they begin to isolate as they get older. And you definitely want to try to avoid that because use it or lose it theory, believe it or not, is critical. And then there's this really important point of um, chronic inflammation or, or sometimes what we call inflammation aging or neuroinflammation, particularly if you, you brought up the Alzheimer's disease, which was one of my mm -hmm. topics that I'm mostly interested in. And so this inflammation is very important because in traditional tools, sort of in the standard Western model, we have nothing to offer to our patients. We can tell them, you know, do live better lifestyle, but what does that exactly mean? There's no pill for inflammation. Uh, people always talk about cholesterol lowering medications. They have zero, let me just put this clear. They have zero data that they prolong life. In fact, there's some data that they may shorten life despite the fact that they may be improving heart, heart risk, decreasing risk of heart disease. But they're actually increasing risk of dying because they have some, some long-term mild side effects that accumulate. So managing inflammation as someone gets older becomes really a function of integrative medicine. And I'll explain that in a minute. So um, I wanna point out to this book, if you haven't seen it, Kordishka, if you haven't read it, you definitely need to read this book. It's called Life. Yeah, David Sinclair. So, yeah, and the it's reason great. is, it's a great book. The, re the main reason is that basically the next generation of theory of aging is probably gonna have to do with what we often describe as kind of a inability for our repair system to stay mm -hmm. optimized. And uh, David describes this in a great detail. He goes into some particular molecular mechanism. I just mentioned sirtuin here, but you know, there's a lot of science that goes into this. I don't want to go into any detail, but I just say, if you haven't read this book for the listeners, you absolutely want to, because it's a great book. Um, and so informational theory, which is what they, David subscribed, which is what I started describing, it's basically that we're our capacity of fix the errors in our own genomic code have a, a certain threshold. Like we just, it becomes unstable. We can't really fix it easily. So this, this damage begins to accumulate. And then this whole mechanism of repair gets more and more distracted. It's, you can think of it as a you know, you're driving on a highway, you can maybe handle one text, but now you have five, six, seven, eight, nine, and now you crash the car because you just got overwhelmed because you can't pay attention to the road. And, and you know, in essence, it's the only theory that so far hasn't been able to be completely disproven in any particular, or that it, they can encompass the, the largest bulk of the problems of aging. I mentioned mitochondria and other things. Those are the parts of a much greater scheme. This uh, theory allows us to incorporate all those other pieces underneath it and say, look, now we have a much more, at the moment, better over overarching theory. That's why I bring it up. So, so why is it important? Well, because the tools that we can offer our patients and each other within the field of integrative medicine or within the field of integrative geriatrics, which I'm going to define in a minute, are really already here. They're non-pharmacological, they're a combination of lifestyle and some holistic methods. And we should be engaging in them. Um, I've been engaging them myself. I know you've been doing some of it. So, you know, we definitely don't have time today to go there, but I have the whole point for our listeners to discuss a little bit about, well, what are the core, core pieces and how do we know this is gonna work? So when I was writing my book, integrated geriatrics, I had to come up with some basic definition because, you know, I felt like you need a, a kind of a structured little piece, little verbiage so that people can start getting used to some, some words. So of course, integrative means that you integrate something with something. So like in this case, you take holistic or alternative methods and you piece them together with the Western model. And so it is a new field of medicine that advocates for a whole person, patient-centered, primarily non-pharmacological approach to medical care of the older adults. The practice of integrative geriatrics is rooted in lifestyle intervention, such as nutrition, movement therapy, mind-body, spiritual approaches that allow patients to have different paths to their healthcare, one that utilizes pharmaceuticals and invasive procedures only when safer approaches are not available or just not effective. And so this is really the crux of it. If you look at the, how we currently handle pretty much any medical problems, it's the reverse. Most of my patients come to me after they tried standard medical model and failed. 
The issue is though that by the time that happens, they lost period of time, they may have side effects of the standard treatments. It's kind of just you starting at the wrong place. So can you start at the right place? Yes, and you're not just can, you must. Here's why, because we really missing 80% of what is actually needed to stay healthy because the moderate medical treatment can only touch, and this is the best evidence we have, only about 15 to 20%. What do I mean by that? Let's say you have a diagnosis of hypertension. The treatment of hypertension is not gonna cure it. It's just gonna put the pill and control the disease, but it's not gonna have, it's gonna have zero chance of fixing it. This is where really the other factors, the social, personal determinants of health, behavior, environment, this is where those 80% sits. And if we don't go there, we'll never get there. So now how do we go there? Well, we go there like this. You can think of your body or your whole system, body, mind, and, and, and soul as the, this kind of healthy tree. The tree leaves in the forest. It, it needs to get the food from the ground. It needs to interact with its tree bodies, tree family, whatever. And you know, if your branches are starting to get in a bad shape, simply saying, okay, I'm gonna cut this branch and hope for the best, which is basically what we do now, right? It's really totally useless in essence because you haven't figured out why this branch fell off or why did it died out and, and you know withered away. Well, the reality is because something in the root, something at the bottom of this tree, it was not operating well, you know, or maybe there was not enough sun. But it's not the internal necessarily issue of the tree; it's more complex problem. And so we are basically having all these parts. Most of the patients coming to see me with chronic conditions going to have issues here. You know, they may. I often see things like uh, environmental problems in people totally unaddressed. Like they may come in with a mercury toxicity causing hypertension, but that was never even brought up in the discussion. And if I find that and I detox the person, I remove their mercury blood pressure, hypertension just goes away. And often when I say this, people are like, oh my God, is that possible? Well, that's the problem. The problem is not that it's, not, it's possible or not, but the problem is that most people have no idea. And so we simply not teaching the society what's out there. And this is why I think the integrative model is critical because we have to not only treat our patients, but we have to gradually kind of get out there. And I see, I think the one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you because I know you're as an entrepreneur and the way you think, you have a much better sense of how do we actually do that? So how do we get that message out? And more importantly, how do we, being objective about it. How do we measure parameters of one's health? How do we assess it? How do we continue to support someone through their moving towards the end, which you know we, we all gonna have, but how do we do this in the most optimal way? And what are the best monitoring systems and, and, and optimizing steps we can do? And is it all about lifestyle? I love this slide, um, you know, because we get bombarded by this and um, the reality is it's not all about lifestyle, but it's a big bulk. How do we know that? Well, we know that from blue zones. We know that this is the zones where people easy, live to 100 or more in the pretty high percentages. It was first described by Dan Butner. And if uh, our listeners haven't seen this book, you absolutely should, because it's a great book. It's pretty old by now. I think the first edition was at least 15 years ago, I think this may be 2008 here is maybe a third or something like this edition. Of course, there's been many since, but nonetheless, um, the, the point here is that we know there's been originally described five areas. Um, Koreshka, you mentioned the Korea, we were blessed right before pandemic, yeah. I think it was 2018 or 17, yeah. that we're together and Nina oh, and, other, and other, one of our friends and, and Misha's, we had a group of friends who went there and spent a whole week living with the Koreans, learning what they do and just having an amazing time. Uh, and by the way, yes, there's a lot of alcohol, but um, <laughs> anyway, things are always a bit more complicated. Lifestyle means different things, by the way. Yeah, definitely. They, they, do, not, they do not live healthy life as it is. Uh, in the way, right, right, yeah, right. By so, the, yeah, right. by the Western, Western, more than traditional approach, yeah. That's right. If you compare them uh, to uh, Loma Linda, Seventh-day Adventists from California who don't drink or smoke, the Koreans are pretty often <laughs> drink and smoke, more, more drink than smoke. 
But anyway, so if you kind of look about the science of blue zones, though, when Dan collected all the data and published in the peer review journals, and then it became a bestseller book, it basically came down to certain core principles. So no matter which zone you're coming from, you move and you move all day long. In essence, you move for hours a day. You have a very good balance between rest and activity. You sleep enough and your daily rhythm is undisturbed. So you don't necessarily going to have one day you're going to sleep from nine to, I don't know, seven and another day from two in the morning till noon. You know, so you're keeping the rhythm steady. Uh, you fast and you fast a lot. You fast almost every day. Believe it or not, in terms of the diet, there are only three things as they listed here. Everybody fast. Everybody's diet is very high in micronutrients and phytonutrients and has a low glycemic index. So not as much sugar as a total amount of sugar. And then the food as medicine. So, you know, you first and foremost, for whatever illness you're developing before you move to any more complex treatments, if the, if the condition is mild, you will use something that's available to you as a food. So in a Korea, we've seen the special types of honey and all kinds of herbs and just growing anywhere, basically just walk out and get it. And then of course, there's this idea that you gotta belong to a certain, certain way of living life. You have a very strong social context. So I would say this are the, some of the absolute core principles. And it's not that complicated. If you, if you look at all this, we can do all of it. Uh, without much of difficulties. I mean, it gets, a, it gets a little sophisticated. And if you have certain things you don't know at all, and you got to learn, well, how do I begin intermittent fasting? Maybe we can, we'll definitely at some point going to have to do another video on that. Um, but this has all been done before. This is all here. We all should be doing it. And with that, um, let's see if we just kind of chat. Um, the blue zones, not necessarily in great detail, summarized in the book, and this is more of a textbook. I'm finishing now with a friend of mine, Len Sharp. We try, we're finishing a book that's going to call Optimal Aging, and it's going to hopefully get published sometime in 2023. So stay tuned for that. But um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let's chat a little more. I'm particularly interested in some of your thoughts as to how do we going to go in the future as the not just healthcare system, you know, as a, what is out there for, available and you're as an entrepreneur, I'm just curious as to what is your take on where are we going to be in say 10 years from now? What, what are we going to be able to offer our, my patients, let's say. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's uh, the, the question which bothers me a lot because I understand that actually we are going to increase the lifespan more and more. And actually, if you are now showing your tables, you show like a, uh, 80 plus uh, lifespan. So I, I assume that by a, by 10 years from now, like, you know, living, living till late 80s will be real normal, but more and more people will live beyond beyond their 90s, mm -hmm. actually close to, to, to 100 years, yeah, to, to one century and then going more. Uh, again, as I said, what bothers me is that you know it will be like 10 years of, uh, of wheelchair racing and you know of being fitted by by your nurse yeah and not remembering who are these people around and so on and actually that's why i want to ask you what do you think i i truly believe that um you know the paracelsus um said by his time is that um Prevention is actually the best cure. And um, I do truly believe in prevention of these conditions mm -hmm. uh, in the like in the in the later stage. And I relate to this as actually your personal investment in your well-being in the future. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you uh, from your from your opinion, yeah, and from opinion from of the medical community. What is the optimal age to start investing yeah, in, into your actually aging well-being? That's a great question. So I, you know, if you kind of think about, we should probably be start investing into this when kids are even before high school, somewhere in the mid school. Okay. Why? Yeah, because some of this, don't do this. <laughs> right. Well, but I mean, in my own life with my kids, we're actually trying to do that. So we're trying to teach them some core basics now. 
I mean, of course, we're failing half of the time. I mean, like, you know, we try to minimize their screen time because I actually think it's more important. That, so certain things we, we have a hard time with, but certain things we don't. So it turns out that, for example, eating right um, is a pretty straightforward concept if you help a kid master it early. And so not go to a junk food and sure, they're always going to ask, they're going to have some weaknesses, right? That's not the point. The point is, what is the 80, 85% of their average diet is? And that's a lot easier than we think. Now, let's say that someone is in front of you and they never thought of any of this. And now come, let's say, 45, 50, when people starting to slow down, when they're starting to notice changes, when they're starting to feel more tired, they may have some accidents that suddenly they have arthritis here and there. I'm kind of talking, but I'm thinking of some people in my life, right? So yeah, myself well. included. So that's probably the age that most of the, most of the people currently going to start asking this question. Now, of course, there could be a lot of people older than that. I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that a lot of people start asking this question. So I'm going through these changes. What can I do better in that age? It's also age where a lot of us have our kids kind of in teenage or even beyond at that point. And so we're a little bit freer. We're not just kind of running around. It's all kids, kids, kids. We actually sort of finally starting to have, and you know, and often our professional lives are also at the point where we have a little bit of a freedom and some financial stability where we can say, okay, well now I can do more as it relates to staying healthy longer. And so, so that's definitely the case. Now, uh, it, it is essential to understand that even if you've done completely nothing with your lifestyle and now it comes to age 70 and you eat crap and you don't exercise and, you know, even at that point, it's never too late. So it doesn't matter what age it is. If, if your expected life, if your life expectancy at that moment, more than just say a year or two, you definitely can improve. You can give yourself not just what we like to say longer years. You can also give yourself a quality to those years. Better quality. Yeah. So it's it's not all about how long we live, as we said. That's the whole point of mortality compression, but also the quality of those years. Yeah. And so improving the quality of those years turns out that when you do that, it almost always automatically translates to the long, better lifespan, longer lifespan. Two for for obvious reasons, which we already discussed. Um, now, how is the, is how essential is it to kind of keep to um, not simply say, look, there's this ten things I got to do, um, and I'm going to go through that. And one of our my next follow up videos will eventually be on something that I define as age wise approach. We'll talk a lot about this mm -hmm. in the future about it. But um, you know, so is there like a set of principles that if I follow them every day, that's the goal? Yes and no. Definitely yes, because um, we all know, okay, well, brush your teeth, right? Uh, if you don't, you're going to have decay. Decay is going to have a comprehensive whole body. So mm -hmm. things like this are pretty straightforward. It's no, because there's a certain point at which we have our own individual weaknesses. And those are the places where we need to spend more time. They not necessarily very generalizable. They may be spread out into certain caveats or in certain pockets, but they have to be individualized. And I think that that's where things like what you're working on will come in the future extremely handy, where you can say, look, how do I actually continuously assess some given parameter instead of just going to a doctor and waiting for a problem to appear? Because as you said, prevention yeah. is always better than yeah. you know, waiting exactly. for a problem. And currently in our healthcare system, we often don't have, we either screen for problems to appear early so we can fix them early, right? Or we simply give people some kind of a prevention recommendation saying, I don't know, eat less carbs or, or move more or whatever. Sure, those are great things. I'm not denying them, but we need to have a much more complex system of monitoring and, yeah. and, and assessment. Definitely, like, you know, what you, what you say is actually the, the protocol-based system is very good for big numbers and for actually for making the population healthy. Mm -hmm. But when we come to any specific piece of human being, yeah, we need, we need personalized approach. And actually, this is what I believe that the next, uh, the next developments uh, of, uh, you know, of computizing of artificial intelligence will bring to the world is actually 
personalized approach to to treating each person not as a, as a part of the protocol but his his personal protocol based on his genetics based on his own habits based on his lifestyle and so on and so on yeah. so let me ask you a question you know you know i'm a huge fan of monitoring devices like you know right now you know you know yeah. my, my love with this yeah, little little piece ring, of equipment yeah. with my aura ring so are we looking at the point where in the near future everybody's going to have things like this are they going to transform into something a bit more user friendly uh where are we going without giving any specifics since i don't think that really yeah works. you know i am a big fan of you know of uh, of privacy and i i am not a huge believer in the total privacy in the future at some point i can um i can cite confucius who once said that if you have to hide something then you do something not right <laughs> And actually, privacy is important. Yeah, but when, like you know, you you do not have to hide that you went to to buy milk at the nearest grocery store. Yeah, so because it is uh, it is nothing criminal in that. Uh, I believe that um, actually we will start, and this is a part of the interest of every single person to be able to collect as much uh, information as possible about himself and to store it about himself. But, um, you know, if speaking like uh, many times, I participate in different kinds of panels and discussions and so on. And it's, uh, it is discussion on the subject of actually of personal data, of, uh, of big data. And I truly believe that data belongs to the person who produces it. Mm -hmm. So my data, it may be as huge as possible. Yeah, it's uh, whatever I do. I don't know what. How do I wake up? How do I how do I snore during the night? Uh, what is the way I'm like preferring to to make love with my spouse? And do, and what is the way I'm hugging my kids, and so on? And can say a lot of about me. But it is my domain. It is my like you know my ownership. So I believe that the future, the future will be the companies which will be able to provide analysis of your own data mm -hmm. for the payment you will do for this. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's going to be so like there will be some kind of a de multiple devices, probably not just one, but multiple yeah, different devices, right? Definitely, we cannot like you know we are not luckily we are not in the Soviet time. Yeah, when you have only one kind of something, <laughs> yeah, one one kind of TV, one kind of refrigerator, one kind of condom, and and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so multiple devices, multiple initiatives. Uh, but the point is like you know we are. You actually mentioned holistic approach. So holistic approach is coming to collecting data from many sources. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure. I truly believe that the future is to be able to connect all of these devices together for your own benefit. Very fascinating. And so what do you think that time frame is? I mean, certain devices are already here. Uh, most of them are currently still like, it's just the silos, right? So the Aura Ring will give me a good amount of data, but it's of course limited. So is there going to be a time in the next couple of years we're going to start seeing integration of all kinds of things or are we a little further out? Like wh wh where are we looking? Here? You know, we will, we will see it in the future. There is, there is a way to integrate this even today yeah, with the help of your uh, major, like, uh, major mobile brands. Yeah, you have uh, Google Health Kit, you have, uh, sorry, Apple Health Kit, you have Google Feet, and, you know, and for those who are using Xiaomi, there is, there is also some kind of health cup, we, we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, still, the information is very, uh, very different. And, for example, if you know, there is a very nice device called Whoop. Mm -hmm. On yeah, the market, a, yeah. So the, the point is, a, yeah, it's opposite to Aura because Aura you have only one ring on your finger. Mm -hmm. of Whoop you can have uh, multiple devices, multiple devices actually installed. So you put one as your uh, as your fitness tracker, and mm -hmm. you can put another one in the actually in in your in your panties to in order to be able to monitor the area of your sacrum because it is very, very nice. And you have also, you can have a sock 
with a specific pocket for the whoop device, so you can monitor the blood the blood uh, blood movement in your in your legs. So you can get actually the complete complete picture of you know of the of the blood movement. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important. Can it be related in in the in Apple Health, for example? No, no way. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Apple Health has very very limited uh, number of parameters they are collecting. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that there will be companies which will start integrating the things together and getting the the wider picture. Actually, combining your uh, blood analysis with the, with your ECG with the results of com of continuous monitoring from different kind of devices. So you basically because, what uh, yeah, basically because, what uh, you the subject, the subject is not the subject is not whoop uh, and not honoring the subject as you. That's right. So what you're basically describing is that the future you we basically if you're interested, of course, I mean, this would you know, I can't imagine how this would be forced, but this would be an optional that you basically have this kind of a centralized way of getting your information. Um, and imagine the possible consequences of that. Well, first of all, as a physician, I'm thinking, oh my God, every one of my patients comes in and I can look at all their parameters for past since their last follow-up and I can understand all kinds of things that's happening to them. It's just dramatically gonna enhance our healthcare. It just enhances how do we deliver the care, the quality of it, and just, you know, it's, it's gonna be so much easier to do management of so many different things that are currently it's just just even impossible uh, or very difficult. So, I mean, that's obvious, but there's even deeper issues here. For example, if you really become a master of something like this for your own life as your person, you can avoid things talking about prevention because you're going to be able to read certain early signs of problems way, way earlier than the healthcare system can. It kind of reminds me a lot, uh, and that's going to be one of our future podcasts for sure. It reminds me a lot of how Ch in Chinese medicine and some of the traditional systems like Ayurveda, they're looking at the illness and health. They're basically saying, look, um, we can predict a lot of illness by looking at how healthy or unhealthy someone is living. And, and, and they have tools that are way finer than, than our current tools. Like it, the blood tests are pretty gross, but they can do a pulse analysis and say, this is what's off killed. And it's so subtle that we don't even have in the modern medicine tools to do this. In essence, you're saying, this is where we're going to go. Now we're just going to go there with our current IT and the models of care and, and, you know, kind of a, instead of going backwards in a more of a traditional historic, we're going to take those pieces and we're going to integrate them with big data. We're going to move them into the realm of the future using computer IT, basically. Yeah, um, exactly. So, you know, a teacher of mine, like one of my, one of my Tantra teachers, um, the guy called Swarup, he was actually the father of Ayurvedic medicine in Israel. He came to Israel to, he was invited by Tel Aviv University to make a lessons on the a philosophy of yoga or stuff like that. By 1992, actually the year both of us came to Israel. Yeah, uh, so uh, he, he came that time and he, he, stayed, he stayed in Israel. And he said, you know what, you, you have to understand that when the Western medicine starts actually to count the sickness, from Ayurvedic perspective, the sickness exists for at least uh, at least uh, a year and a half, if not three years. Before. So yeah, and, yeah, and I that's... truly believe, and I truly believe that using 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 the modern algorithm, the using big data and very very detailed methods of analysis, we would be able to forecast actually the the coming of some kind of sick condition and be able actually to revert it even before it became the, the physical, before it caused physical damage. I can I can give you a super simple example from today or from last week. So I got mild COVID. It's okay, I'm recovering. My aura ring picked up that my body temperature was elevated and I wasn't recovering well 24 hours before I started actually having symptoms. And, you know, we know that th this is only a beginning. I mean, we're going to have more and more examples of things like this, where we actually, instead of just me looking at it, we're going to yeah. be able to actually take action and say, oh, wait a second, there's something going on. Let's not wait till it gets worse, but do something right up today. So it's fascinating topic. We'll have to. Uh, yeah. Coming.
coming to Amazing. it. Um, I know you have a lot on your plate uh, to move forward to do more development and kind of a more future figuring out, well, how does this actually practically gets done? Yeah. Good luck with all of that. Um, yeah. I'll have to have you back. Good luck as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, um, yeah. you know, I also want to say that you're in a tough spot right now. You're not in Ukraine, but you're in Russia. And, you know, I know how difficult uh, yeah. it is for you to manage at the moment with uh, people who work for you and everything is so complicated. So we'll... Yeah, you know, I hope we will overcome this uh, this very soon. And actually, you know, it's a very, very, very tough situation. You know, I cannot, I cannot say I'm ashamed of because I always support Ukraine. Like, you know, actually, all of the years starting from 2014. So I hope that the situation will be resolved as soon as possible. I understand that there is a lot of um, actual of responsibility again. Yeah, even if it is not guilt or responsibility, responsibility always remain of on, on us. Yeah, and on us as Russians, it, it will be the responsibility. Yeah. But what I, I would like yeah, to remind that actually we are still, maybe we are only 20 or 25% here of the population. But we are opposing and we, we opposed actually for years, even by the time that, you know, many people in the West were more than welcome in Russian oligarchs and Russian money and, and all of that. And we tried to urge them that guys do not play with evil because evil will pay against you by the end of the day. So I hope we'll see the victory of the, the well against evil very soon. Well, wishing you best of luck, my dear friend. We'll have you yeah, back. Yeah, thank if, you. Thank you very much. And if anybody needs to get in touch with you, just send me a message. Um, you guys, uh, my, and then I can I can screen and can have you contact. Definitely. Great. Boyish. Okay, Mishka. Thank you very much for your time, guy, uh -huh. and have the, the pleasant end of the weekend. We're here almost uh, midnight. Uh, no, not midnight, but yeah, but very, very late evening in Moscow. So... See you soon. See you soon.